welcome uh, governor saab um, for for having us uh, for being here and for um, for your presence amongst the amongst the audience so paul i think uh, a lot of these things that you talked about was um, i would wholeheartedly agree and endorse with i think you know one of the things with the younger generation is they are not into investing in building your brand they ask how do i build my own brand and i think that is where the role of hr role of c is so important that one has to work and capture the hearts and the minds the imagination of the people and i think you talked about it the mission it doesn't have to be a 9 to 5 job the purpose of life is not to go and earn a money and and to live off it it is to be much more than that and something i talked about is the mission you talked about some of the mission statements you know google ki mission statement had to organize world's information and make it universally accessible and useful microsoft ki hai enable people and business to realize their full potential and create technology that is accessible to everyone this sounds more like a revolutionary statement than a statement of market share profitability all those things so this is how these organizations are doing a great job in terms of capturing the imagination of young people attracting good talent i think someone who has been a visionary um who has had a massive transformational impact in pakistan in the banking sector is amongst us and we'd be very uh, uh, pleased to hear his views of course uh, that is mr um, shaukat uh, tareen sahab who has had a very illustrious career in city bank uh, for the first 20 22 years he rose to be head of pakistan um, as well as thailand in pakistan he was responsible for making the franchise uh, grow seven fold in terms of his balance sheet about six fold in its his profit um and of course the good thing about um, mr shaukat tareen saab was that not only he worked in a multinational environment he came back and he served the country and i would like to mention particularly three instances where he has had made an enormous contribution to pakistan firstly i think the role that he played in the transformation of hpl from a state owned enterprise into what it is today i think hpl now mashallah is an organization that can go global and that can do a lot of um, and can build pakistan's brand abroad and us usme shaukat tareen saab ka from 1997 2000 had a huge role in taking it from a loss making entity into nearing um, nearing break even um, and uh, as you know loss of a public sector entity is our own all of ours loss so he had the had that role to play in that the other role he had was of course the role he played in C as ceo of union bank which he managed to sell to uh, um, to standard chartered bank for which the investors returned 1800% when i was living abroad one thing that struck me was the standard chartered bank had a bigger presence in pakistan than in india always india is doing much better than pakistan in everything but in this case is a is a case of immense pride for me that in one instance and that had everything to do with the purchase and acquisition of union bank and i think we you know we have a lot of mergers and acquisitions happening we must acknowledge where it started we started from mr shaukat mirza the m management buyout of of engro in 1991 and of course in 2006 jo hua tha is one of the first ones they actually trail blazed the whole uh, uh, sector in terms of merger acquisition now we are seeing the benefit of it and i think as his the finance minister advisor one thing that he managed to achieve was the consensus on the national finance commission award jo ki 19 years se hum log agree nahi kar sakte the i think it was a matter of great public service where all the provinces got together shaukat tareen saab stayed that um, process in doing that he has been a mentor to many and i think one thing i must acknowledge in front of everyone is that my first work experience internship and that goes back to 1995 is because of mr shaukat tareen there was city bank in pindi as people who know pindi know that pindi starts from one end of ghq and it ends at the other end of ghq and the only other thing in phd in pindi there is is a pansard ki city bank and mashallah uh, uh, shaukat saab was a mentor and and everything that i've done as a result of that starts from way back in 1995 when when he was very uh, benevolent and very helpful and i'm sure like that he has been to many other people he has been chairman of pakistan bankers association stock exchange um 
He has been a, a, a wardie of the Sitar e Imtiaz. In any ways, a person who has served the corporate sector, Pakistan, in many ways, has transformed the banking sector. We are very privileged to have him with us, sir, um, and in the audience to hear from his experiences of how he had a massive transformational impact in terms of banking and the organizations uh, that we've worked with. We, we have Mr. Khurum Rahat. Who is the um, who is a graduate of IBA? We have a lot of alumni uh, alumni of IBA here, and he is the MD of Terra Data for the last ten years. Mr. Khurum would be moderating the discussion um, with uh, with uh, Mr. Shokat Tareen Saab. Uh, we are very privileged to have him. I leave it to you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Salam alaikum, uh, everyone. Uh, Shokat Saab. Shagat uh, welcome uh, to the forum and uh, we are all very anxious uh, to hear your uh, views about the topic. Uh, just a brief introduction uh, around the topic. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've grown up hearing this phrase that change is the only constant in life. And um, so, so a lot of time people say what's, what's different? Uh, the only thing from my perspective I see is that the change is happening at a very fast pace. Add to it the complexity uh, in terms of the disruptive technologies that we are seeing, add to it the globalization, um, the renewed vigor towards entrepreneurship which uh, means that a lot of talent that people want to now work for themselves and not work for organizations. And then uh, to top it all, uh, there is this challenge uh, with regards to, uh, uh, and it's an opportunity in terms of uh, renewed focus uh, of HR towards uh, gender equality and diversification. Um, all this obviously creates a lot of uh, challenges and opportunities for organizations, particularly uh, the HR function. And um, that has kind of created a uh, bit of uncertainty, volatility, a uh, bit of ambiguity, uh, and complexity to the organizational structure and the HR function. Um, so obviously the good thing is uh, I'm not here to uh, share my views about it. I have the easier task of asking Shokat Saab his opinions uh, around what he sees, how he sees this HR function performing and developing uh, over the uh, years with this uh, all complexity uh, and in a very fast changing world. So Shokat Saab, uh, you know, uh, would really appreciate your views, uh, your initial views. How do you see this? What's your perspective based on your experience? How have you seen things change? Bismillah Rahman Rahim. <coughs> Mr. Governor, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I spent now almost 42 years in my professional life, which as was mentioned and I think uh, the tribute was greater than what, what I expected and I deserve. But the very fact is that I've been in the multinationals, I've been, you know, running the public sector and I've been in the government and also in the, the local banking sector as well. All this you know, I've just realized that there are certain standard fundamentals which have to be followed, no matter what environment, no matter, you know, where you are. And it all starts with your vision. You've got to have a vision. As you get up in the morning, you basically have to decide what do you have to do in the, in, uh, during the day. Unless you don't decide that, you're not going to get anywhere. So you need to have a vision and you need to have then obviously our derive out of the vision a mission and then value, value, uh, value system, which is going to be, uh, you know, part of your organization. And this is where I also have a problem, you know, in my, my country, that we basically have lost our vision. We basically, I, I think we, every government comes and they have their own, you know, set of, you know, objectives and, you know, but where is the vision for Pakistan? The vision which was laid down by Qadi Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, 
which at times, you know, in during the sixties, we, we did have, you know, a planning commission, effective planning commission, which basically used to give us a roadmap. And we were doing, you know, uh, reasonably well. So I think one of the things which we need to have, you know, in an organization is have a vision. And then, of course, for an organization, a business organization, we need to have a business strategy around that. Now, to take forward this process, the business strategy has to be uh, implemented. And this business strategy, firstly, should be uh, prepared with the help of a, a, a team, you know. You've got to just get a team in place, and the team obviously must have the skill set to take that business forward. And actually, it is always useful you take, you know, that, uh, you know, team and also when you are making the strategy, then they should have the input because then they will have the buy-in. And once you have a the good team uh, and, and obviously a business strategy, then, you know, the process, the meritocracy, pay for performance, uh, you know, uh, reviews to, uh, to make assessments, this is the standard, you know, uh, in all major uh, good organizations. Now, when we come t down to human resources, because, you know, that is the only constant. Most of the uh, people think, you know, that, uh, you know, when we go to technology companies and others, human beings, you know, are less important. No, in every field, I think it's a human being because we are serving human beings and we, we are run by human beings. So training and development of human resources is is, is extremely important. Uh, moving forward, because I just have few minutes to just give you the brief, the, the intro introduction, and then I think we are going to get into question and answers. There is one other thing which, you know, I see, you know, missing, you know, in uh, most of the organizations. And that is that we do not allow people to make genuine mistakes. Just think of it. If we have to go and, you know, uh, explore new frontiers and you do not allow your people to make genuine mistakes, you will never go to the new frontiers. So the, develop the culture that you will not basically reprimand people for making genuine mistakes. The only thing you should basically expect out of them is share them with others and not repeat them. So if they share their mistakes and not repeat them, you will earn a lot. But I'm not, I'm talking about genuine mis mistakes. And then of course, I think as I, we, we just heard that we must have a strong culture of change management through customer feedback and benchmarking against the best in, in class. This has to be constant all the time, keep just going back to your customers, keep looking at what the best in class is doing. I think this is where you basically will find that you will just uh, uh, keep ahead of everybody else. Now, I mean, if we talked about VOCA, I mean, environment. So I think, you know, uh, when we talk about VOCA, which is, is volatility, you know, we are looking at, you know, examples where uh, there are prices fluctuate because there's a national disaster and this, there is supplier which is, you know, basically offline. Or policies shifts, you know, you, know uh, uh, you just invested a lot of money putting up, you know, uh, a plant which is basically based on electricity. And I'll just give you this real example in Pakistan. And suddenly the electricity is, is switched off. You, you know, you're basically uh, stored that you don't have electricity because the country doesn't have electricity. So, you know, this is, this is a major disaster. This is really volatile. So, I think, you know, you've got to just uh, account for by just, uh, uh, you know, having alternatives. What if I don't get electricity from, you know, KESC or KS, uh, Karachi Electric? So, what do I have to do? You know, so I think uh, uh, the, uh, alternatives, then you should also build, build in a slack. And uh, also, I think uh, in, in terms of, you know, uh, um, inventories, you should have uh, extra inventories. This b basically means you have to spend something extra, but then um, factor that in, in your, in your uh, you know, uh, business model. Uh, uncertainty, this is to me the, the most uh, dangerous uh, uh, thing which 
which means let's say a competitor, you know, you suddenly you're doing business, suddenly a competitor comes in with a product which muddies your water. That's one. The second is, again, you know, you, you know, you invested long term in a country and the, on a certain basis, you know, uh, government policies and suddenly government changes and the policy changes. So what do you do? So this is where I think you… you uh, firstly, I can tell you this form of uncertainty for a country is devastating because capital basically is… Uh, runs shy of uncertainty, will not come to countries, uh, will not invest in industries where there's uncertainty. So I think from your perspective, you know, well, if you are there, invest in information, collect, you know, uh, interpret and share it. Uh, it works, I think, best in conjunction with… Uh, uh, with the structural changes, such as adding information, analysts, networks, etc. Complexity. Complexity is when you are dealing with multiple, you know, markets, multiple products, and I think this is where you need to uh, depend on specialists. Bring in specialists if you do not have, you know, obviously you do not have experience, bring in specialists in those businesses and those countries which understand these things. And the last one is ambiguity. And this is it's like, you know, you entering, you know, uh, emerging markets, immature markets, and you just basically don't know where, you know, you stand. You, you know, you're… Uh, f uh, floor under the… Uh, uh, under you is, is… is… is shifting or is… you're not certain. So then test. Go in, basically do a test. Go… go… Uh, do an experiment. Don't just go whole hog, you know, for, um, and put in all the investment, you know, front end. Just do a test and as you become sure, as you just basically understand the market, I think you basically will sh should just keep investing. So I think these are some of my views on, you know, uh, what I think and these are the opening shots. I would just then uh, uh, look for some uh, questions now. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Shaukar uh, Very insightful thoughts. Uh, uh, absolutely your point about having a vision and then having a team to uh, take forward the vision or implement is key. Uh, so, one question you talked about, uh, obviously, volatility, um, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Uh, these four factors, in your opinion, which one of the four would be your prime concern or you think to be the most disruptive from an organizational perspective? As I told you earlier that I think uncertainty is the most disruptive. Because you… If, if you are not certain, you know, capital, you are putting capital and you're doing business and you, this capital, obviously, capital knows no boundaries. Capital go, flows where it is profitable and it is, you know, there is certainty. So if you bring in capital and you, you know, suddenly find, you know, that the environment is uncertain and it, you know, changes day to day, then you probably would like to invest short term in that environment, in that business. So I think this… this uncertainty is the most disruptive. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we've talked about this fact that, you know, um, in, in today's organizational world, uh, the organizational loyalty is, uh, you know, becoming almost instinct. You know, people just do job hopping, they change jobs. Uh, for monetary reasons, for wanting to have more diverse experience. So as an entrepreneur, as a manager, what do you think, uh, uh, you know, uh, are some of the things which HR can do or, or an organization can do to retain and motivate such talent? You know, loyalty uh, comes with the, you know, uh, when people think, you know, that uh, they are being taken care of, their families are being taken uh, care of on a long-term basis. And this has happened with countries, it has happened with organizations. Countries such as Japan where, you know, when you enter an organization, it's lifelong. And it's a culture in the country. So, uh, you, 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 you obviously had loyalty over there. Then there are organizations. I think my… the governor, you know, knows that. Then in… in case of IBM, IBM… IBM used to be a lifelong, you know, kind of, you know, uh, company where you entered IBM, most of the time you'll just leave… retire from there. And that's what gave them the loyalty. 
But you know, things have changed because that has also its own, own, own you know, b b uh, uh, obviously uh, that did not work because, uh, you know, b in a changing world, in a world where, you know, you obviously look at, you know, uh, the performance, at times, you know, loyalty versus performance, you know, used to be uh, at odds. So, even Japan, even IBM, they started you're looking at, you know, tr trying to look at performances of people and, you know, uh, releasing, you know, some of those people uh, during their uh, employments. Now, that meant that, you know, obviously people started looking at, you know, they were a bit insecure and they started, would always look at, you know, other organizations so that they can jump and move, move over. So, in, 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 in such uh, environments, obviously the Western world and then it moved on and we have also now seen organizations over there who started having you know, some retention tools uh, like the golden handcuffs. So, people started, you know, giving people the compensation but on a deferred basis and started building their future capital and was saying that you stay with us and you, your future capital is going to build. So the, you know, golden handcuffs, etc., are some of those things which basically uh, uh, um, uh, do contribute. But my own sense is that, you know, um, uh, training and development at the initial stages, at the initial stages in organization also are kind of golden, golden cups because people would want to go to an organization where they can learn, they can fill their tank with knowledge. Uh, so actually, uh, you know, what you just shared brings two questions to my mind. The first one is, um, um, you know, today with this um, fast-fading organizational loyalty, people wanting to um, do job hopping, um, brings an interesting question to the organizations. Uh, should they be looking to have training and development plan to uh, invest on people only to see them leave once they get experience? Or sh should they follow other organizations which are now focusing on just going into the market and buying the talent, what they need, the experience they need. So, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, there are basically uh, at different stages in life, you know, there could be different tactics. Organizations should not just follow one, you know, uh, scheme of things. When you hire people fresh, you got to train them. Because when you hire people fresh and you got to have people who are fresh, because unless you do not hire, you know, fresh talent, you know, you will obviously, it's like a stream, you know, you just cut one side or block one side, you know, the water is going to turn uh, stale. So you need to have fresh talent. When you bring in fresh talent, you got to train. And the better the training you have, you know, the better chances those guys will stick around, you know, for a while and, you know, add value to your business. Now, as you go, uh, you know, up in the, in the ladder, uh, clearly, you know, if you need uh, people, talent, you've got to go into the market and, you know, just, you know, get the skills you, which you require. So, it's a, it's a two-step thing. So, my, there's nothing wrong, you know, in, in either or, you know. But I think it is not either or, it is one plus two, you know. So, my own sense is that you will have to hire, you know, fresh blood, give them good training, and also, you know, hire skill-based people from outside. They bring in, you know, not only the experience, uh, they hit the ground running, but, the, you know, they also bring in another culture, you know, another set of values. Fair enough. Uh, so the other point was around this, um, you, you talked about retention policies and golden handcuffs. Now, a uh, lot of organizations over the years have, uh, you know, followed this uh, uh, concept of some having, you know, it's good to have some iteration in the organization, meaning that every year you have to identify your lowest performing talent in the organization and kind of encourage them to leave, uh, which may not mean that they're, those guys are doing bad, but it's just that they are the, you know, at the lowest end of the talent pool you have. What's your perspective on that? Absolutely. It's necessary. For, uh, for uh, meritocracy, retain meritocracy, pay for performance, and obviously uh, a, uh, a certain uh, level of performance, you need to basically have a, a grid. 
whereby you reward the upper, you know, the, uh, the, the better performers. And, and then, you know, obviously uh, 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 give, you know, enough to uh, sustain to the people who are average and uh, remove the people uh, at the bottom because they have not performed. And you've got to be fair. You have to have very clear objectives to start with and sit with them and explain to them what they have to achieve. And if they don't achieve those, and during the year you need to have some uh, sessions with them. And when they don't achieve, it does not mean in 12 months he does, the person does not achieve, you fire them. It's that you give them another chance and say, okay, you have another three to six months. And these, these are organizations who are fair organizations. They develop, you know, uh, reputations, uh, you know, uh, of their kind by doing these things. But, you know, after 18 months, the guy has not done, uh, you know, the person has not performed, you know, you know, he doesn't have any rights because this, you know, he is impinging upon, you know, uh, uh, somebody else's right. So they have to go and you basically, uh, there has to be. And now there are organizations who basically have, let's say, four, you know, level and, you know, aggressive organizations where the top 10 percent are excellent and then the, the 20 percent, the next 20 percent and then the, the and, and then the 40 and, and, uh, and the bottom 20, and the bottom 20, you know, we have to go. But then there are organizations who just basically take off, you know, the, uh, like uh, bottom 10 percent. Uh, but the, the, the good thing, or, or rather the important thing over here is that you've got to make sure that you reward the people who are at the top, top 30 percent very aggressively, because that will breed a better performance from others. And the rule of thumb is that if there is an average increase, let's say compensation of 10 percent in a year, the, 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 uh, the top 30 percent must get at least two to, two, two to three times. The 10 percent must get three times. And so that the other guy, there are two guys who are starting off at the same time in an organization. Guy you know, performs in an average and the guy is 10 percenter. The 10 percentage should be at least two to three times in salary in four or five years' time. And that is the way you basically build in, you know, a kind of uh, an organization, you know, which, which is competitive. Very interesting. No, I agree. Um, you know, these days there's, there's a lot of focus on entrepreneurship, which is, you know, really encouraging a lot of uh, youngsters, especially people fresh out of uh, universities and colleges are being encouraged more, to, more and more to uh, become an entrepreneur. Uh, this is this is great, but um, do you think this is a challenge for organizations because then uh, organizations are probably not getting the top talent in uh, you know to work for them. Rather, they are working as entrepreneurs, and then the kind of second tier is coming and working for the organization, what impact it would have on an organization, what's your opinion on that? Well, I think entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship is a frame of mind. I think there are certain types of people who just like to do business, like to, do business, like to you know, uh, excel on their own. And it is a very risky business. It's, a, it's you know, they are risk takers. And not everybody is a risk taker. There are a lot of people who basically get educated and they just would like to have a normal life. And maybe, you know, they work aggressively, they're, you know, just good performers. They, they, they exceed expectations, their own expectations also. But, you know, they would like to have a very uh, defined life, you know, uh, path. Uh, or. Uh, compared to the entrepreneur. Entrepreneur knows that he's taking risks, there will be highs and there will be lows. One day he'll be, he could be a, a billionaire, a millionaire and the next day he could be a pauper. But, but they just enjoy that. I think this is, you know, in their genes. So I don't think corporates should be, you know, worried about them. My own sense is that when we are going recruiting people, then we should understand that the people who are risk takers, and your businesses obviously needs, you know, a steady people, then you should avoid taking some of those guys because they can also be detrimental for your business. But my own sense is a, a risk taker will certainly, you know, uh, will take risks and not do a steady job. Um, I mean, that's interesting. So, brings me to another question that 
Um, do you, what's your opinion, what's your message to the youngsters? Uh, you know, do they need to get some experience before they try to become an entrepreneur or they should just make a deep dive? No, no, I think uh, uh, my, through my own experience, I can, you know, obviously I can demonstrate, I've demonstrated that I just uh, did, a, you know, some work, professional work, you know, when I started doing banking, I started doing banking because I knew that banks actually deal with all sorts of businesses. So I'll pick a business, I'll just learn about that business and then become an entrepreneur. And I gave myself, you know, ten years. Sorry, it was not ten years, it was twenty-four years. <laughs> Till I move uh, as an entrepreneur and I just, you know, bought my own bank or rather, you know, I managed, uh, you know, bringing investors and that was union. So this, that was after around twenty-five years, sorry, after twenty-five years and it worked. Uh, but you know, there are ups and downs, you know, union bank was a great success and then again, you know, when somebody asked me, why the hell did you get into silk, huh? you had this, uh, you made some money. You should have gone, you know, just taking it easy and frankly relaxed. I said, sorry, that was not in my genes, you know. It seemed like once I became an entrepreneur, it would kept coming back and so now I made a, a bad deal and I got to work it out now. So that is, I think my advice would be that unless you, you are a Bill Gates or, you know, some of those kind of people or even, you know, I would say uh, in our local environment, I give credit to that guy, Malik Riaz, you know. I mean, obviously he was on a Vespa and, you know, look uh, where he is now and he worked his way up. But he never did a job, you know, he always was looking for a business. So, but my way of doing things would be that, you know, to gain some experience and then get into entrepreneurship if you have got it in you. Uh, just brings me to one uh, in, last interesting question. Uh, you know, you started your career, um, then you uh, obviously over the years became a, a, a manager and a senior manager and then an entrepreneur. So all these three stages, uh, how did your uh, opinion or your uh, impression of HR function transform, you know, someone starting career, someone being a manager and then someone being an entrepreneur? I think it developed over a period of time. I think the, uh, the uh, significance of human resource and uh, firstly, uh, because I started with multinational, they always have, you know, certain um, uh, set principles, you know, and, and frankly that I was lucky on that. But even then, I know that, you know, when I used to be in city uh, CFO here in, um, at a very young uh, age in Citibank in Karachi, uh, the HR function used to be run by our country manager through uh, his secretary and myself. And he said, Shaukat, please help her. And that's it. That was the HR. Now I think Citibank, you know, same organization probably will have 15 people. So I think over a period of time, the significance of HR, you know, has basically uh, meant that people have started paying more attention to the, uh, the, uh, the, the human resource and uh, it is the most important, uh, you know, element of any business or any country. Walter Riston once said, uh, you know, uh, the assets of the, uh, the most important assets of the, the bank, they go home to sleep, which means they are the human, uh, you know, resource. And I can also say that the countries who really take care of their human resources are the countries who actually over a period of time excel. Take the uh, example of Japan. Japan obviously has no material resources or not much and look at what they did, look at Singapore. So all these guys basically developed their human resources. But they all started with, you know, you know, as I said, those four, five points which meant, you know, you start with a vision and, you know, and, and human resource development will be one of them. But, and and the, one of the most, probably the most important. So I basically over a period of time realized that I, we cannot achieve success without, you know, uh, uh, having good uh, team and obviously with their involvement and without, you know, giving them the motivation that if the organization has to succeed, they have to succeed. Yeah, that's great. So, so, you know, eventually you realize HR people are not so bad after all. I, I always realize <laughs> that they are good. <laughs> 
Uh, so, sir, uh, before we conclude, I uh, would like to, uh, you know, uh, hear any, uh, you know, final thoughts, final comments from you. Yeah, I think I initially started off by saying that you, you have to organize yourself before you're embarking on any, any, any uh, major mission. Whether you're running a country or you're running an organization or you're running your own house, you know, you have to know where you are, uh, uh, what you are going to do. And what you need to do is that vision, that, you know, plan must be uh, prepared, uh, you know, uh, with those people who are going to actually implement. So you need to have a team. I think all those successes I've had, you know, in the past, I just give credit to the team which I had. So you've got to prepare a very strong team, the team which is not going to say, yes, sir, but team which is going to just tell you what is good and what is bad. And unless you also do not uh, develop this uh, a kind of uh, ability to give credit, so I think you must have this bent of mind that all debits will come to me, which means all failures I will take ownership, all credits, successes I must share with my team and give it to them. Only then you will have a very coherent, uh, you know, a loyal and a dedicated team. So I think this is, these are the kind of things I've learned over a period of time. It's all teamwork. Without team, no single person. And I was thinking the other day, when people talk about sports and they talk about sports which are individual sports, like tennis, like badminton, or, you know, uh, 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 other things. It's also a team. Federer would not be winning if he doesn't have a good team supporting him. I mean, you know, b b b similarly, I think uh, every team, even if it is a team sport or an individual sport, needs a team to succeed. So my own s emphasis now in life is that you may have a vision, vision, that also should be actually prepared with the help of a team. And then they must have a buy-in with all the strategies. And then you must, again, the last thing, give them the credit, take the debit. No, thank you very much, uh, Shaukat Sahib. Very insightful. I absolutely agree uh, with your uh, comments. I think uh, the key takeaway is that uh, leadership has to have a vision about future, build an organization then that can navigate uh, it uh, through the good and bad times. And I guess it's very interesting that, you know, you have to, in the organization, have a policy of uh, golden handcuffs, um, as well as look towards having some uh, conscious attrition to make sure that you have fresh blood, you have the top performers, and you recognize and compensate those top performers. Uh, once again, thank you very much for very insightful thoughts. Uh, I think all of us have, uh, you know, really enjoyed uh, and we have learned a lot from you. Thank you very much, sir. Definitely 42 years of experience and Khuram Saab, thank you very much for moderating it and, and Shaka Saab, uh, of course, pearls of wisdom. Uh, I think your human-centric element, you have been very successful and the, uh, an African saying comes to my mind, which is, if you want to go fast, go yourself. If you want to go far, go with others. The importance of teamwork in building great enterprises.